Hi, my name is Peter and I'm here to introduce you to the history of England, its laws and the development of trusts and equity, the recognition of equity after the arrival of the Norman kings, in particular William I. And I'd like to start by saying that we need to recognise the differences between the French aristocracy who arrived in 1066 and the people of England who lived on the land of England before the year 1066. We're going to study the reasons why the, Normans king, the Norman kings came to England and we're going to study the reasons why the effects of the Norman king's arrival have brought us where we are today under a corporate democracy that is assuming control over the lives of people. One interesting point about English law that's been very much ignored is trusts and trust law. Trust law is property law, it lives in property law and the overriding law form of property law is equity. Now, most people know equity as a part of the acting union. Also in finance, we have um, equitable, um, equitable finance, <laughs> whereby a company, Standard Equity for ha uh, perhaps, have used the name to represent that there's a balance in the finances between yourself and their corporation which is an American term and from here on in we'll use the English term which is company and all the companies in UK which is a company are registered to the UK at Companies House. Now the reason that they have to register at Companies House is because it is illegal in statutory law to operate a business in trade and commerce without a license. Do you have a license to trade in commerce? I very much doubt it. But by way of your birth certificate, you probably do. And that's what allows you to operate in commerce. Now, let's look back into the time before the invasion of William the Conqueror on English soil. So we had a king who had promised the crown to William, who was living in France, and he was promised the crown of England as a gesture of goodwill. And on the king's deathbed, he actually changed his mind and handed the crown of England to Harold. Now, Harold was kind of duped really into something that he didn't want and he upon his accession to the throne he had to fight a war that year in Yorkshire where he was where he was victorious and from there just a couple of months later he had to march down to Hastings to fight a second war which was against the Norman kings well particularly William the Conqueror and he was defeated now, there was already a law form established between the shires, hides and counties of England and those law forms were active and very strong and basically it was a common law of the land which was unwritten and had been encroached upon by um, earlier invasions by the Romans some thousand years ago but had maintained its uniqueness in that it was never, a, the Roman civil law was never adopted in England per se, because the Gallic people of England, um, after the fall of the Roman Empire, moved back into the territory where the Romans had occupied or usurped. So we have a law form known as common law. Now, when the Norman kings came, they brought with them a form of civil law which is built up from Roman civil law and their law form was 
contra to the law of the English people. So William I being someone who didn't want to force his law in case of a revolution probably because there wasn't that many Normans per se. What he wanted to do was he wanted to allow the English people to continue to run their law form as very often uh, when there is an invader they will allow the people to continue their own laws and this was demonstrated uh, quite recently in South Africa where South Africa has its own law form based on English law and yet um, a guy claimed his race law, his people's law, which they far outdates the uh, forming of South Africa, which is Zulu law, and he married four women on the one day, which is contra to the laws of South Africa. So we see how it's been established that people can use their own law form upon choice. Now, how do we operate this? So if we're English, we have a law form that we may not recognise. <laughs> and what are the chances that we need, that we understand how to operate in that law form? Now, the particular law form I'm talking about was recognised after the arrival of William I. And it was called equity. And equity was given courts at the king's bench, whereby it was deemed that the king's conscience the king being the representative of God, would give a more fair remedy in law to the situation, to the charge, to the claim, than in common law where remedies may have been lacking. So each case was done on an ad hoc basis and this is in the courts or what became the courts of chancery. And the courts of chancery were basically set up for, from the king's bench. Originally, the king had been the only sort of guy who people could go to and express their claim or their case. And um, the king would draw upon his conscience and offer his thoughts as a remedy. And then people would generally, in good faith, act upon you know, the suggested remedy. So as time went by, obviously the king became far too busy and what he decided to do was appoint people who he could trust. And one of the people who he could trust, he felt, was the Lord Chancellor. And the Lord Chancellor became the head of the Chancery Courts. Chancellor, Chancery. So we're talking about chance. <laughs> what are the chances that we get round to that in law?